of uh, all of you who have got wonderful solutions for them, there's opportunities to collaborate. So if you think you see a problem and you think you know how to solve it, uh, please come talk to me, because we have lots and lots of data that we can use to sort of validate your suggestions. Um, so according to Praneet, the, the goals of this, the theme for this workshop was uh, sustainable growth and uh, sustainable development uh, goals, right? That was supposed to be one of the themes. So I figured we'd at least consider what, what that means. So we have two of those 17 themes were uh, promote uh, well-being and then reduce inequality among countries. So a lot of the work that we do uh, is in global health. Uh, and I think what I wanted to talk about today is some specific applications and why things like federated learning might be quite interesting uh, in that context. So one of the reasons that we might want to think about federated learning is that many countries have rules about data leaving the country. Uh, they have not made rules quite yet about model weights leaving the country. So I don't know what that means quite. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to continue to explore is when they say the data cannot leave the country, can, the, can we do federated learning across, across borders? So I don't know how many people have tried it. There's been some experiments, but I think that's something that I'm sort of curious to see if we can do. Uh, so one of the areas that we work on is uh, cervical cancer. It's a, uh, one of the, it's got very high mortality and morbidity worldwide. Um, and the sad thing about it is it's, mostly preventable and treatable if caught early, but in a lot of lot, many, many parts of the world that's not happening today. So there's both a vaccine and there's also a diagnosis and treatment, and if you do that ahead of, in time, then you can sort of address that. It's really very much preventable through uh, vaccination and diagnosis. Uh, the other interesting thing about cervical cancer, it's a fairly well understood mechanism. Uh, pretty much every case is associated with HPV infection, uh, and so this is sort of the, uh, the, the flow from uh, g getting infection, it can um, disappear, but then in some cases it progresses to precancer. If you catch it at that stage, you can uh, treat it and uh, get rid of it. If you look at the mortality rates across the globe, you see this really sort of disparate uh, map. So it's pretty bad. Even within the US, it's bad in certain areas, but you really see it parts of Africa, parts of South America, where you see very high rates of it. So the uh, WHO has got this, uh, this plan to address this issue by uh, both a vaccination campaign as well as screening. Uh, the vaccination campaign is going to take a long time to make an impact. The screening can happen today. Uh, and so this is sort of an economic model of how uh, both a combination of screening and vaccination can help. Uh, and this is a very large um, group of people led by uh, and the National Cancer Institute in the U.S. with people across the globe, uh, all working on this, this project. And there are 10 sites. Um, this is the, the way it's going to work. So you essentially, it's uh, uh, sort of, you go into the, uh, into the local areas, women self-sample, uh, get an HPV uh, testing and typing. If they're HPV positive, then they're sent to a local clinic. And the typical, uh, what people do today is essentially uh, paint the uh, cervix with acetic acid, look at it visually. Unfortunately, the visual examination rates are barely above chance, but that's what is happening today uh, in terms of diagnostic accuracy. So it's not a very, very great test. So there's a lot of interest in using AI to sort of improve that uh, overall. And if it's positive, you treat and test and treat right then. So the NCI had developed an algorithm. They got excellent uh, accuracy, 91%. Everyone was very happy. Uh, and then they started to look at it in the clinic, in, in the field, and it completely fell apart. So, and we've heard a lot about distribution shifts. We've heard about other things that can go wrong. So the algorithm was trained on one camera system, and then they went into the field with a different camera system. The images look slightly different, and suddenly the model performance is essentially not there. So uh, we, again, this morning we heard a lot about, both yesterday and today, we've heard about this notion of uh, these models not working as well under distribution shifts. Uh, so again, based on the lessons, so they published a really wonderful lessons learned paper about uh, all the things that they did wrong the first time around, and then, which is on the right side there. And so what we try to do is address a lot of those issues and have a second version of the model. 
Uh, right now, we're in the process of recruiting 100,000 women over the next year, uh, year, year and a half. And then we are going to actually um, see how well our, our algorithm works in the field. And this is kind of scary, right? So a lot of what we talk about normally is on toy problems, uh, or, or maybe even things like the next word prediction in your phone. But when you're talking about people's lives, if you don't get it correct, it, it is enormous risk, especially when you're talking about going into c communities and this, this notion of trust that had been brought up, right? So you want the community to trust you, that you're doing something safe, that something is correct. And so we have to be a little careful about what we do there. So, The other disease we do a lot of work in is this thing called ROP. It's a leading cause of preventable childhood blindness worldwide. Uh, again, it's very much a problem more in low and middle income countries and places like India. Again, great treatment options, so diagnosis is important, but again, access to care is, doesn't exist. There's not very many pediatric ophthalmologists in India, for instance, and so how can we do that? So again, um, so there's a variety of reasons why it doesn't work so well. There's a lot of variability in the ground truth. Uh, there's uh, num in insufficient number of people, and this is very much, again, a un uh, problem in many, many parts of the world. And so the way you diagnose this disease is looking at the back of your eye. Going from left to right, you see that as the vessels get more tortuous, uh, the, the disease severity is higher. So it's from an algorithm perspective, it's relatively easy to train an algorithm to do so. But again, the challenges occur because of the camera differences between protocol differences, but also because the color of the fundus is different in different populations. So if you train your algorithm to work on a Caucasian population and then take it to uh, India, it looks different. It doesn't work as well. Uh, so we, we, again, when you're thinking about building these algorithms and deploying them globally, we had to think carefully about what the data used for training was. Uh, so we've shown that it is the algorithm that we do can uh, help with the inter-rater uh, agreement issue. It can be used to ac improve access to care, uh, reduce the number of follow-up visits, but also do things like uh, improving outcomes. So we've looked at hospital systems and used uh, this, this model to quantify disease severity across hospital systems and found a hospital that doesn't work as well. Uh, and so then we can go back and sort of examine what's going on there and then come back and say, OK, uh, here was, they didn't have enough blend oxygen monitoring. They, they had all these issues. So we went back two years later and found that a lot of those issues had been fixed. So. Based on these and other experiences, we've done a lot of sort of going from something we built in the lab to deploying it and have learned a lot of lessons, somewhat tumbling uh, experience, actually. The, the models don't generalize. I mean, this is something that I've mentioned earlier, everybody has mentioned, but one of the biggest problems is that you build a model in one place, you take it somewhere else, it doesn't work as well, uh, especially in sort of medical imaging. We had issues with the models not been, being repeatable. So right, uh, many diseases lie on a spectrum, but we force them to into bins. So they're not, it's not a binary. It's not yes or no. It's sort of a spectrum. And right around the boundary between uh, positive and negative, the models don't, are not very repeatable. Calibration is a huge issue. Our models are not well calibrated. And very often, we don't see calibration curves. Uh, we don't know how well calibrated the models are. Uh, there's lots of silent failures. The models are confidently wrong, and that's a big problem. What we hope is we have measures of uncertainty that translate to the likelihood of it being wrong. But what we see is it's confidently wrong. <laughs> that's a problem for us. Uh, explainability. Most of the methods that have traditionally been used for explainability don't seem to work as well as we'd like them to. Uh, and the models can be biased in extremely hard to detect ways. And I'll come to that in a second. So the distribution shift has been, again, in medical imaging, talked about a lot. Very few of the algorithms that are FDA approved in the US have actually been tested on external data sets, which is a problem, again, because the algorithms have gone through the FDA process where they were just trained and tested on the same sort of uh, internal one single scanner system, so we don't know how robust they are. Uh, so the things we see are scanner differences, protocol differences, prevalence disease differences, the disease differences. But the one that's really uh, hard to deal with is this con potentially confounding between things of interest. So for instance, if you look at breast density and you look at race and you look at breast size, they're all um, 
in, there's an interplay in a way that the models sort of pick up on shortcuts. They don't pick up on the thing of interest, they pick up on shortcuts. And so we have to be careful that we're not doing shortcut learning. So uh, again, we, we trained on one scanner, uh, one institution data tested on another. On the diagonal, you get great performance. Off diagonal, the performance is terrible. If you have access to everything, you get a good model. If you do federated learning, you get a good model. Uh, yeah, it seems to learn scanners first and then diseases. The same thing is true for the uh, fundus photographs. You train on one population and you test it on that same population, you get excellent performance. You train it on the North American population and test it on Nepal, you get terrible performance. Uh, same thing was true in cervical cancer. You train on one camera, uh, you get, again, the on-diagonal elements are excellent, the off-diagonal elements are really terrible. The other issue we have is ground truth. We don't know what what ground truth is, because we often rely on what's in the clinical record or what the doctor says, but that's not necessarily always truth. Uh, there's an opinion. So you, you get the same set of images as six, eight different doctors to grade them on, a, in this particular case, a three-point scale. It's color-coded by that, and you see they have completely different answers. Some people have a lot more uh, reds, and some people have a lot more greens. And now when you're training the model in one, based on one doctor and testing it on another doctor, you find that this is a challenge. And when you're thinking about doing this in a federated setting, you don't even know that, right? So you don't have access to the, the, the ratings from the different sites. So how do you know that the, your ratings are biased or noisy? Uh, so that's something that I think we, we continue to sort of struggle with, especially in a federated setting. Uh, shortcut learning. These models pick up on spurious signals. This model for chest, uh, for COVID, for instance, uh, I think this was COVID, uh, was, uh, or pneumonia, was picking up on the marker. Uh, basically, there's a chest, the marker on the uh, image that says it was left or right, and that says whether the, position, the patient was taken in a prone or a supine position, meaning are they lying or standing, kind of, uh, or uh, face up or face down and whether they were standing and lying, and it really depended on whether they were in an emergency room or in a walk-in clinic. And all the model was learning is the fact that this was, patient came from an emergency room and not that it's something about the disease severity. So we have, this gets even more complicated to figure out when we are in a federated setting because we, don't, we can't see the data. We can only see sort of the local data, we can't see all the data from the other side. So how do we sort of learn that? Uh, this is something that has come up a lot, is that our models are trained on very non-diverse data sets. Most of the publications, most of the published models, at least in the US, are coming from essentially three states. And most of the rest of the world is not represented, represented in the data sets that have been released or the models that have been released. And obviously that's not great either. This, I don't know if you guys have seen this work, but this is absolutely fascinating. Just looking at a chest x-ray, the model is able to learn what self-reported race is. How? Nobody knows. We've, I mean, no clinician can do that. What is it this mod that this model is picking up that it seems to do so well? And what are the implications, again, for that in a, in a setting, especially in a federated setting, where you don't know uh, what sort of spurry signals it might be picking up on data that you cannot see. There's a lot of questions of bias. We've, we, we see a lot about uh, how these models can be biased and what that means, especially in the medical imaging space. Uh, a really cool area, that sort of the flip side of all of this, is this cool area of oculomics. So just looking at the photograph of your back of the eye, the models seem to be able to tell all kinds of things about you. What's your risk of cardiovascular disease? Are you male? Are you female? What's your BMI? How old are you? How? <laughs> Again, no human can do that. These models can tell you if you're going to have Alzheimer's disease in five years, if, you're going to ha if you have Parkinson's disease today. So they are phenomenally good at these sorts of things, but given that the humans are not there, cannot do it, how do we check? How do we check it in a, in a distrib under distribution shifts? How do we maintain fairness under distribution shifts when we don't even know how to, how to validate it? Uh, so if, if, at a minimum, we need more data. We need diverse data, and that's where 
again, the opportunities with federated learning, I think, are so huge, is that we cannot afford to just have models built on a single institution data from a very small section of the population. We need, we need lots and lots of data. Uh, so we're hoping that they help us build more generalizable, model, generalizable models. We don't know for sure that they do. Uh, and some experiments have suggested that they don't necessarily do that. Uh, they, when you have three scanners and you build a federated model, model for those three scanners, it works well. You bring in a fourth and a fifth scanner, it doesn't necessarily work well on those. Uh, so that is something that I think, as a field, we need to figure out more. Uh, the, the area that we are interested in is rare diseases. There's really not enough data at a single institution to build a model, so we definitely have to have a federation there. And hopefully, when, when we bring in, we allow people to collaborate, we bring in more uh, diverse data sets. Uh, so this is an experiment we did with this ROP, which is a very rare disease. Some institutions have very small number of uh, patients, some have no positive cases. Uh, and what we essentially showed is that by doing federated learning, we can get a model that works uh, at least as well as a central model. Uh, and it, some of it, it really has to do with the number of the training set size. If you really don't have enough data at your institution, then uh, it's really hard to figure out how to do that. And also the number of positive cases is important. So the question that had been asked this morning uh, that I thought was a really interesting one is, what does it mean in the, this era of foundational models, right? Does the fact that we now have foundational models change anything? Do we still need federated learning? Do we think we can get away with just having a foundational model that is like super useful for every task and you just do uh, fine tuning on your local data? Uh, so that's something I would love to hear other people's opinion on. Uh, so our, our very recent and very small experience is perhaps you don't need quite as much in the sense that if you have a really good foundational model and you fine tune it on your data, it seems to, general, it seems to work quite well. Uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to explore that, but I, would, I really would love to hear other people's opinion as to whether you need to do that. So this was a really good, uh, uh, interesting work from more fields and uh, Google, I guess. Uh, and essentially what they did was build a foundational model using a million uh, uh, color fundus photos as well as a million OCT images. So they built this fund foundational model, they made it available publicly, and then they showed that it works really, really well for downstream tasks. So uh, they had a whole bunch of tasks, uh, in both in sort of traditional tasks like uh, ophthalmology related, so can you identify diabetic retinopathy, can you identify glaucoma, but also these really sort of um, tasks that are surprising, right? Can, can you predict Parkinson's? Can you predict heart disease? Can you predict uh, MI? So, and again, having this foundational model seems to be really good in order to do that. Uh, this is some work that uh, Daniel Rubin and other people at Stanford did in sort of combining federated learning with, uh, with self-supervised learning and seemed to suggest that, again, that might be a useful uh, approach. Uh, so, yeah, we've been working, playing around with some of these models. So we've been looking at, uh, again, uh, MAEs and dyno and other things in terms of uh, the cervical tasks as well as the ophthalmology tasks. And it does seem like we get good performance. So uh, it seems that with a fewer short a number of cases of the new domain, it seems to learn well. Uh, and so that's something that we'll continue to be exploring over the next few weeks and months. Uh, we heard a lot about incentives yesterday. That's something that we, can, especially in this global context, we have to think very carefully, and maybe uh, our <laughs> Annie will talk about it as well. But how do we incentivize people to participate, not, not just here for a research paper, but, but really for sort of good uh, of both their own local environment as well as sort of a global model. So it's usually like, what is it in, what is it in for me? Because it's a lot of work. There's no resources. There's a, doing federated learning is not trivial. Getting people to have infrastructure to do that is not, not, trivial, not trivial here, not trivial, especially where there's other, like in the places we are doing the cervical cancer screening, there's barely enough bandwidth to send the data to a cloud. Now asking them to say, okay, let's do federated learning seems, like a big ask. Uh, so what, how do we incentivize participation? What are the true risks? Many governments want to know 
are we when we're sending the data out, uh, what what are some of the risks? I mean, we're not we're saying we're not sending the data, we're sending the weights, but what are the true risks that they should be worried about? How do we want think about uncertainty? Uh, this this universal question of do we want a single global model? Do we want personalization? From in medical domains, it's usually hard to change because you have FDA approval and the model sort of frozen. Uh, how they are thinking about continuous learning, but do we want personalization? Do we want global? Do we want, uh, where do we want to go? Uh, this question of unlearning, right? So we've trained a federated morning model across data from multiple sites. One person now says, take my data out. Well, are you allowed to do that? What, what do you, how do we think about that? Uh, when we've had conversations, I mean, we heard a lot about Shapley values yesterday, but People uh, we've had have different opinions. I mean, this is the stakeholders, the participants. Whether you, you should count, how do we measure quality, right? How do we make sure that we're getting good quality data? How do we diversity? The, so often the measures that we use don't necessarily pick up on the fact that you may not have the small subset of population that you need because it, the model performance is sort of gro global aggregate and not in that very small subset. For instance, we had a COVID model. It worked really well, except for extremely obese people. And we didn't know that till much later in the process. So how do we know what attributes of the patient change the performance of the model? So, so lots of questions that I hope everybody here can help us with. Uh, how do we deal with heterogeneity? We had, and we, I saw some interesting posters, but we have the say all kinds of it, right? We have covariate shifts, we have label shifts, we have concept shifts. All of them happen routinely in our domain. Uh, one thing we keep worrying about is how do we know that the model is no longer working? And there's been a lot of work in looking at data drift and sort of how do we put guardrails? How do we have meaningful guardrails that say, okay, if your model has, de if your data has deviated from something, it, your model, you should be very careful about applying your model to that data. Uh, calibration is something we need to think about. Uncertainty quantification that is meaningful. So a measure of uncertainty that somehow helps us know that the model is not confidently wrong. Uh, how do we do federated learning in a resource-constrained settings? Uh, the question I guess I had is are there, are this just, Global problems, are they unique to something we're doing? But these are the things that are especially challenging for us. So we have, the, we cannot make errors, right? We can, this is, a, we're talking about people and cancer screening. We really cannot make errors. Uh, how do we deal with calibration? How the, do we, uh, the data are almost always non-IAD. The interoperability, especially in a federated setting where you cannot see the data, is a huge challenge. The people, the, date, the images are labeled, the sequences are labeled differently. It's very hard to know, are we talking about the same thing? We deal with very small data sets compared to other, other problems. The ground truth is very uh, sort of murky. Uh, so I, I was trying to get uh, a generative model to give me a good good image, I failed completely. But I wanted to sort of have two sides of this coin, right? So people have, this is a, I thought it was a really important quote, which is, if we, it is unethical to not allow AI to have, to be sort of used in places where it's needed. If you have a model that is good, and is better than what is happening locally, then it is our moral obligation to sort of put it out there. On the flip side of it, we have all these concerns about bias, about ethics, this, this notion of digital divide. And so I was really trying to get a good example of that. I failed miserably. But I think that is something that we think a lot about is this, this notion of how is it, when is it good enough to deploy? Uh, what are the things that we have to be worried about? So thank you. Questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. That was just a really wonderful talk. Um, and you know, you're doing all of these things under very kind of controlled conditions, and you're following it up to make sure that the models are safe when they're being used, and you're doing randomized control trials. But just to kind of also open up to to other people about what's happening in the real world in the industry. 
So I'm working with um, Fine Diagnostics, which is a basically like a WHO tried to make sure that there was a validation process for all of these AI models that are commercialized, right? So um, what's happening in the private sector is that um, there's some AI models that are being used for um, automatic diagnosis of x-rays and they're being sold to governments. And they're being sold to governments because they have 99.99% accuracy, right? And no one is, there's no guardrails. There's no guardrails and they're being sold to the poorest um, populations ever, you know. And there's no safety net when they go wrong. So if they go wrong, you don't have some doctor yep. that's backing them up. And so what we're doing with them is we're building a validation platform where you can basically, it's kind of like a Kaggle-esque kind of competition. <clears throat> and just to kind of ask the question, you're 99.99% accurate, says who? Right, says who? And what we found was really, really scary. And these models that are being used in practice are sometimes slightly worse than, than random. Yep. And, um, and so I just wanted to say, like, I, I, I don't have a question, but I wanted to say that you're doing this the right way and you know I'm also running lots of randomized control trials and I really think that that's the the future is to try to take the models that we're making and to test them because no one else is um, and, and so thank you what, 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 what lovely work thank you um, I don't know, anyone else Yeah, a nice talk, very realistic. Um, so I had a question on what the calibration problem is referring to. Is it the calibration with respect to different scanners, or is the, yeah, so what is it referring to so, in the medical? So if you plotted a calibration curve of probability versus uh, like the styles of occurrence, the models are really poorly calibrated. And they're very often con confidently wrong. And that's the part that scares us, because they'll be quite confident about the answer, but be wrong. And so how do we know that they're wrong? Uh, so this is somewhat different than like a multi-label black box model prediction, or the problem is that different from a multi-label classification? Even a binary classification, the models can be, uh, if you just plot a calibration curve, they don't look. Oh, maybe I'm missing what the calibration curve means, I guess. That's, I mean, so, it's a very silly question. No, 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 uh, it's a, uh, the way we plot, calibration curve is used, essentially take uh, deciles or whatever of probability from zero to uh, one and say what fraction in that each bucket was a positive case versus a negative case. Mm -hmm. And that should be rel sh your, if the model is well calibrated, it should go, uh, it sure. should follow that line. Mm -hmm. And very often they're not. Uh, so, so people do temperature scaling, people do a variety of things to get the models to be recalibrated, but those things break under distribution shift sometime. So. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I agree that uh, having diverse data is very important. Uh, but think about uh, in federated learning when you allow different parties to contribute that data. Uh, it's possible that some clients, they may contribute low quality data. Yeah, um, it can be the noisy labels or, for example, they have uh, the old version of scanners uh, in such case. And sometimes those kind of low quality data may come in from those minority groups. So I feel like there might be some contradictory needs that we want something to have good performance, diverse data, and also we want to pursue fairness. Uh, I would appreciate your comments to, to this point. I think it's a great point. I have no comments. Uh, I think it's a really important point, but I think you're completely correct is that very often there, is an, there can be an association with data quality and disease severity, for instance. So in the eye, for instance, you get poor quality data when in a more diseased patient. Same thing with uh, like a chest x-ray or, or even a brain scan. When a patient is move, a, a sicker patient will move more. So there's an association with low quality but more disease. So I think you're completely correct in that they can be at odds. So trying to get 
a good representation of different things can also mean that quality goes down and potentially the overall model goes down as well because you're, you have bad quality in it. Uh, so I agree, that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your comments. Thank you, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you um, about the role of uncertainty and uh, whether, well, it, I assume it makes a difference whether we're talking about the epistemic or aleatoric uncertainty, so whether it is the data or the model. And if it is the model, then maybe you can get away with it with better generated data but, also. But if it is about the data, then you might uh, look into, like as a community, we might look into uh, active learning solutions. So how can you prioritize certain data over other? Uh, I don't know if you have any further comments. Actually. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think trying to separate those two is challenging. Uh, and I think certainly some things we can do in terms of, uh, but the active late learning is something we've done with, especially in trying to figure out the next, la next case to get labels on. So that, that can help find the cases that are more uncertain, for instance, and help uh, with that. But I, 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 yeah, active learning is something that, uh, especially in medical annotation tasks, has been quite useful. Do you have any comment about the uh, active learning and then the, the motive to actually contribute good data in the active learning subdomain? The, I, the last part I didn't hear. So. so in the active learning subdomain that we're talking about, uh, do you have any comment about what is the motive for the federated entity uh, to contribute good data? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I mean, incentives are, are challenging, right? right? So, yeah. uh, okay, thank you. I just wanted to make a comment about this. Uh, I, I don't know have, uh, the point you made about we don't really know why those models are answering the the way they are. Yeah. Um, there's this line. Uh, there's this work by like, Sendil Mulainathan. I saw you cited one of his work uh, on hypothesis generation, where they basically train a counterfactual. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a generative model. I'm but curious if anyone tried that. We, 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 we've spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, so we've created a generative model that flips the class and looked at the difference of it, and we think we have something, but it's it's uh, it's definitely speculative at best. So uh, we have, one of our students is writing that up, but essentially when we did that, and we looked at it in the race, uh, chest x-ray race domain, it, it seemed like it was highlighting like the bones around the, uh, the clavicle and the right around here. Uh, as well as some um, something in the like uh, uh, just around the base of the lungs, uh, so it, it was a clear signal, and we could definitely flip. So the way we did it is we trained the model to go from one uh, race to the other. We looked at the differences and confirmed that the classifier was predicting it correctly in the the other one, and then there were looked at the areas that were highlighted by in this um, and. It, there were things that seemed like it was happening, but lot, I, I just worry about some of the, it, it, it's a little speculative, so yeah. But if, if anybody solves that, I'd be like really curious to see what it is. So. Uh, I, I just have a, a, a small comment on that. Um, I used to volunteer for the, um, for the police force when we used to find bones in the field or something and they want to identify if they're like human or animal or what race. And it's interesting because we did, we, we had like some things you'd, you'd measure the clavicle right. and, and make a whole lot of measurements and put it into, an, into something, but you can't see it as a human. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to see it on an x-ray, but with a whole lot of very complicated measurements, we were able to do it. So. We, we should definitely talk. Maybe yeah. that. Maybe that is it. It yeah. was exactly that. I mean, it was right around the clavicle that it was picking up. So. Yeah, it was, it's the clavicle versus the length of the some you know lip of the, right. the glabella or something. And, you know, I don't know, whatever. But uh, yeah, you got it. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thanks so much, Shashi. Um,